Well, welcome to Proctor Academy. Uh, so very happy to, to have you all here for this event tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Thomas, he, him, and uh, I am here um, to welcome you to this wonderful event put on by the Andover Historical Society uh, about Richard Potter. But before we start, I just uh, want to give a little bit of a, um, we, we had uh, John around him from the Pine Ridge uh, Reservation. I want to give just a little bit of a, a land acknowledgement. We are, as you know, on the land of the, uh, the Abenaki and the Wabanaki uh, and the uh, Pentecook uh, peoples, and we give thanks and gratitude for all of those folks who are here. Um, and in many ways, it sets us off into this amazing, amazing event tonight, because probably at the time that Richard Potter was here, some of those people were here as well, right? And our job in many ways is to call back to us, uh, as Potter would do, uh, folks in a really magical, amazing way um, of inclusivity. Uh, not only was Potter, uh, and, and John Hodgson will talk about this in just a little bit, the foremost celebrity of his time, but he was also, um, you know, they said this about a former president, transcended race. And um, being able to navigate what he must have navigated during the time uh, and, and in reading the books. I feel a, a special sense of, uh, of urgency in the job that I do as the head of Proctor, but also in keeping the spirit of life of inclusivity and belonging in this area and in this region. We are so very lucky and fortunate to be able to be here together uh, to celebrate this man uh, in the way that we are. We're on the eve of our 175th anniversary as a, as a school. Uh, and just to, to think about it, so that's uh, 1848 when our school began, our roots began. Uh, and just a little time before, 15 years before, Potter was still up and running and performing. So just think about that. Then in, in, in this lifetime, a, a small child uh, who had maybe gone to this the school maybe even had the opportunity to see him. And maybe even some of those parents uh, in the Butterworth uh, living room where the school was founded, they would have known him well, right? We uh, stand on his shoulders. Uh, I certainly stand on his shoulders. As I was driving across the country and I was hitting all of these various Andovers in Ohio and New York and outside of Vermont, I think there's one they tell me down in Massachusetts. Uh, um, we, um, we, we really do and are fortunate that we're in this Andover. And, you know, Potter could have picked any Andover, really. Uh, but he picked this one. Uh, and he picked it because somebody in his in his entourage, as it were, the other person in his entourage, uh, was from here. And I, I, I said this in, on August 8th when the plaque was unveiled, I can see why. This is one of the more, most welcoming places that I have ever been. And I feel a sense of gratitude and a debt of gratitude to the people that are not only in this room, but also the folks that I see every day across the street at JJ's, um, our families who are local, um, and, and the people even much further um, from where the school is. I feel a very sense of gratitude, not just because, like Potter, I was, I was also sort of in the industry, as they say. Uh, I was a, a professional actor before I, I came to this work. But I was also, like Potter, a researcher. I was also, like Potter, an apprentice. Um, I was also like Potter, a big idea kind of person who could put some of those idea, ideas into some frame that people responded to. And, I, and that's what I think about Potter. I, I think about somebody who, in his time, not only was well known, but was well loved too, right? We should all be that fortunate to go out into the world and to be so well regarded as Potter was. Uh, and I, 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 every time I pass 
that open place where his home was and even the burial plot where he, um, his shell lays, um, I, I think about him and call to him often to, to ask for wisdom because obviously that's what he gave. Even though his life was hard in some certain places, um, I think people really loved him. And, um, and I think even as we are, you know, almost 200 years later, 190 years later, he calls to us. He calls to us uh, to be kind. He calls to us to be good. Um, he calls to us to share our gifts with the world. I think that's what Potter does, and that's the gift that he gave the world. And it was obviously a pretty quiet gift because not a whole lot of people I certainly didn't know who he was before I got to Andover, but it's hard to not know who he is once you find out about his story. And in many ways, we have John Hodgson's to, Hodgson's to thank for that, but we also have this recognition, and I'm going to introduce, I'm going to be your master, Masters of Ceremony for this evening. I want to introduce right now Jerry and uh, Bogus to come up uh, to give us some remarks, a little bit of an opening and to tell us a little bit more about why Potter, why her group really decided to recognize him on the African American Heritage Trail. So without further ado, thank you again for being here. And Jerry Ann, will you please come up? So thank you so much for having me, and thank you, John, for pulling this together. Actually, I didn't know about Potter either till John came to us. And that's the way it's been with the black history here in New Hampshire. We're always uncovering, unearthing, reintroducing the story that was disappeared here in the state. And it gives us an opportunity to really think about what the state was, what the state is that we're living in, and what it could be. As I said, I'm Jerry Ann Bogus. I'm the executive director for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, where we're working to include these stories in the bigger narrative of what New Hampshire is. Um, there's the danger of having a single narrative where we tell one story from one point of view and that becomes the major story. But when we include New Hampshire's black history, we see a whole different state. We see a whole different people, and we can appreciate our African American history and the people who made it, the people who lived in this state, not as stereotypes, but humans who were very integral in creating things in the state as well. And I'll just tell you a little bit of some of the people and how that, how that's really changed the state for me. Because like many of you, um, I had lived in the state for 30 years and didn't even know there was black history. And what that change has done for me to find that out. I lived in Milford, New Hampshire. And in 2002, I, there was an article in the paper about Harriet Wilson. Uh, State's Forgotten Daughter is what the title said. And I found out that she was the first black woman to publish a novel in English in the world. And she was from Milford, New Hampshire. And that changed the whole perception of the state because it created roots and a sense of belonging in a state that often is described as the whitest state in the union, right? So imagine finding out a story that a book published in 1859 and walking around our town. As you all know, New England towns don't change much, right? The buildings are still there. The street names are still there. The way you get to the original owner of the family, the generations still own it. So I was walking on a street that she walked on back in the 1800s. So that created a different image. Over in Newmarket, we had Wentworth Cheswell, who was the first person of color to be elected to public office. And again, for a state that loves our 
first in the nation voting. Here we have the first person to be elected to public office in the country, a black person. And he held the position, every single position in the town he held at one time or not. And he also graduated from Governor Dummer Academy at a time when the stereotypical thinking was that blacks were incapable of higher education. So we have that story. And Noyce Academy, another one, the first in our state back in 1835 to open a academy for black students that was integrated not only by race, but by gender, the first of its kind here in New Hampshire. And there's so many more rich stories that once you unfold and you unearth and you look at them, gives us a different understanding of our state and the people who lived in it. So that's the work we're engaged in. And here in Andover, of course, you have the story of Richard, Richard Potter that was bring to light and totally integrating in the town of Andover to create another place for dialogue, you know. We don't only, what we're engaged in at the Black Heritage Trail is putting up these markers like we did for um, Richard Potter to create visible signs of this black history because it's so easy to erase these stories. But once you see these markers and we have them from Portsmouth all the way up to the White Mountains that are coming along as we do our work. And we have a major conference coming up October 21st and 22nd that will talk about um, the whole uh, financial um, institution and what that means for African Americans and black people, people of color on a whole. And so without much ado, I'm gonna pass the mic back over to the head of school and um, look forward to chatting some more or answer any questions at any time around the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. You know, one of, the, one of the things that I wanted to do too, uh, which is not on the program, but I just wanted to introduce and acknowledge uh, one of Richard Potter's um, brothers from the Prince Hall Lodge, or representing the Prince Hall Lodge, uh, which is this gentleman right here. Um, please stand for us and just say hello. Uh, <laughs> the Prince Hall Lodge uh, figured prominently in, uh, in John's book, and um, and the thing that really made him famous is basically what we're gonna get a little bit of a taste of uh, right now. Um, Dan Richard is a, uh, a ventriloquist and wrote a book called Ventriloquism for the Total Dummies, so maybe somebody like me. Um, and the thing that was really remarkable was not only was he a ventriloquist, a magician, and sleight of hand and all of the stuff that he did, all of the amazing things that he did, but he was able to, again, pull all those people together um, and, uh, and have them amazed. Um, and, and in some ways, that is the work that we should be doing in schools, instead of like what you can teach and what you can't teach. Wouldn't it be great if we just delighted people, right? That you came to be delighted. So I'm hoping, uh, again, without further ado, to introduce Dan Richard to delight us. Well, anyway, I am Dan Richard. This is my friend Conrad. I am the ventriloquist. You're not the ventriloquist. I'm the ventriloquist. The, 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 you the ventriloquist in the last show. That's right. Well, it's my turn to be the ventriloquist. No, no. Ventriloquism is something you take turns with. You are the ventriloquist, you're not. You're either the employer or the employee, the employee or the employer. That's the way it works. I am the dummy. You said it, I didn't. And he is the dumber. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I, I have to say something. We, we were in England, and I was extremely embarrassed when we met the king. My fly was open. No, my fly was not open. You don't walk over to the king and say, hi, Chuck. Why not? You just don't do that. This is, this is England. You, you, you have a whole protocol of respect. What does that mean? 
Well, you see somebody, uh, a, a royal person or something, you say, yes, your lordship. What's that? What's what? That. What? Do it again. Your lord, yeah, yeah, that, that, that. that that's a respectful bow with the knees. What? Yes, they, they do that in England. We don't do that in America. They, they, they bow and they curtsy in, in England. We, we don't typically do that here. Uh -huh. Well, I think I got it. No, you don't. Okay, so uh, <laughs> when you see the Lord of the Manor, you say, yes, your lordship. Mm -hmm. And you see the lady of the Manor, you say, yes, your ladyship. I think I got it. Go ahead. When you see the royal letter writer, you say, yes, your penmanship. Yeah, that's not what I meant. When you see the commander of the Royal Navy, you say, yes, your battleship. That's not where we're going. <laughs> and when you see the royal matador, you say, yes, your bullshit. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and we also visited uh, Avon, the home of uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare was a very famous uh, writer. He wrote Jome Romeo and Juliet. Were they pen pals? No, no, no. Uh, Romeo and Juliet is a play. It, it's about the two people who fell in love, Romeo and Juliet. Romeo was the son of the Montagues, and Juliet was the daughter of the Capulets. Romeo was the son of the Montagues. Right. And Ju Juliet was the daughter of the Capulets. Now you got it. And their families didn't want them to get together. What else is new? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they were feuding. But anyway, there's a very famous scene where Juliet is up in the balcony, separated from her beloved Romeo. Why, they couldn't get two orchestra seats? No, no. No, it, it's a play, but not that way. So anyway, uh, Romeo turns and he says, Hark, what's the matter? He had a bone stuck in his throat? No, no, no. It, it, it meant something like, look. Oh. So he turned and he said, Hark, why didn't he say look? Because in those days, they said, Hark. Oh. So he turned and he said, oh, well, when did they start saying look? I don't know. I'll bet you can find that information on the internet. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. I'll hark it up on the internet. <laughs> OK. So he turned and he said hark, because he didn't know how to say look. <laughs> what light through yonder window breaks? Who broke the window? No one broke the window. You said someone broke the window. Nobody broke the window. Then why did you say someone broke the window? It's, it's, it's a metaphor. What? It's a metaphor. He met us for lunch? No. <laughs> He met us at dinner. No, no, no. It's it's like the politician. You know, when they say something, they don't act. It means something else. Oh, I got it. Okay. Right. So, um, you you uh, wanted to uh, sing a song. I did. Uh huh. What song did you want to sing? Um, I'm going to sing. Oh, ode to a credit card. Ode to a credit card. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna. No, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Okay, go ahead. Um, now, I, I, I wrote the, the, the words and the lyrics. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, here I go. You forgot. I did. <laughs> you are my credit card. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You are my credit card. You are my credit card. You make me happy when I don't pay. You'll never know, dear, how much I owe, dear. Oh, please don't take my credit card away. Very good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you sang that without musical accompaniment. Yes, yes, I sang, sang it at Acapulco. <laughs> mm. OK. You wanted to play something on your bugle. I do. What song do you want to play? I'm going to play the William Tell Overture for those of you who like classical music. OK. And for those of you who do not like classical music, I shall play the theme from the Lone Ranger to <laughs> together, okay. simultaneously and at the same time. OK. Those are synonyms. Yeah, I like, syn I like that on my toast. <laughs> Now you might notice as I play, I leave out a couple of notes. Don't worry, I throw a few extras in at the end to even it up. I'm very good at it. It's quite a play. I've been playing a long time. I'm sure. On the next time. You don't have to brag. I like to. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you.
And now I'm going to do something unusual. I'm going to call up Paul Revere. Now, you know, there are all kinds of lines. There's uh, help lines and timelines and all sorts of things. This is a, a, a method to call up people of the past. Really? Mm -hmm. What time zone? What time zone? Yeah. The Twilight Zone. Ooh. Do, 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 do. What manner of devilishness is this? Uh, excuse me. Oh, it talks. Uh, excuse me, I wanted to call Mr. Revere. What is this thing? It's a telephone. It was made by a guy named Alexander Graham Bell. That's why it goes ding-a-ling. If his name was Alexander Graham Cracker, it would go crunch, crunch. <laughs> Sir? Oh, uh, yes. I'd like to speak to Mr. Paul Revere, please. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, sir. He's not in right now. Oh, I see. Shall I take a message? Mm -hmm. No, I'll call him again. Very well. Sir, sir. Yes. I believe I hear him coming. Whoa. Sir, it's the you. What is that devilish thing you have there? It's a telephone, sir. It was invented by a guy named Alexander Graham Bell, so it goes ding a -ling. It was invented by a guy named uh, oh, <laughs> Alexander Graham Cracker. He go crunch, crunch. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Revere here. Yes, uh, Revere here. That rhymes. So it does. And so what? Oh, well, Mr. Revere, I just want to... Who is this, anyway? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm a reporter uh, for a great metropolitan newspaper fighting a never-ending battle for truth, justice, in the American way. Clark Kent? Yes, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to know is, uh, I wanted to check the facts with you. Yeah. You had someone in the Old North Church. That's correct. And uh, they had two lanterns. That's correct. And you had a code, one if by land. And do it by sea. That's correct. I know, I set it up. Yes, you did. Now, when you saw the two lanterns, you, you hopped on your horse. No, I jumped on it. Yes, you, you <laughs> did. And then you ran through the countryside. No, the horse ran, I rode. <laughs> of course. And then you shouted, two arms. Two arms, two arms, the British are coming. Good heavens, uh, are we under attack? No, 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 no. You, you're not under attack. No, no, Joel, it's, it's just this telephony thing. Oh, but I wanted to ask you, sirs, what did you say at the end of your famous ride? I'm thirsty. <laughs> no, that wasn't. <laughs> I'm hungry. No, no. I'm tired. I'm sure, but that wasn't what you said. Well, what did I say at the end of my famous ride? You said, whoa. <laughs> Mr. Revere? <laughs> Mr. Revere? Listen, while you're at it. At it? With these silly telephony crazy things? Yes. Would you call it Ben Franklin? The famous Ben Franklin? He's not as famous as me. No, not at all. And tell him to uh, 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 go fly a kite. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> hmm. Thank you. You know, there's a lot of solo singing at the Proctor Academy. A lot of solo singing? Yeah. Isn't it? You have all those solo panels? <laughs> yeah, right? Right? Yeah. See, they know. They're solar panels. No, they know. They're solar. Okay. Um, now, this is, uh, this is my grand finale with cards. Okay. So, when I finish, I'm going to go, ta-da! And then you clap and cheer. Clap and cheer. Okay. Don't forget, you clap and cheer. We got it. Now, this is very hard to do. What? This is very hard to do. This is very, very hard to do. Hard to do, yes, I'm sure. It took a lot of practice. It looks a lot like cactus. No, no, no. It <laughs> took a lot of practice. It took a lot of practice. Okay. But don't drop the cards. What? Don't drop the cards. I won't drop the cards. But if you drop them, you'll pick them up. If I drop them, I'll pick them up. I pick up anything I drop. What if you drop the cards? You'll still take them up. <laughs> Go ahead. Here goes. They taste funny. What? They taste funny. Don't eat them. I'm not eating them. They just taste funny. You've been slobbering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Does anybody have any questions while we're here? No? Okay, I pass it back to you. Yeah. Thank you. That, that was delightful. Um, trying to imagine that 190 years ago. Um, and you can, can't you? You can imagine that 190 years ago. Um, and, and also trying to imagine, too, uh, John Hodgson teaching a class of undergraduates or graduate students, um, certainly at my alma mater, maybe even at his alma mater, um, all of the things that that were undiscovered in, um, in history. And, and the work that he has put into this book is just magnificent, being able to, to read it and see it. And in fact, I, I asked uh, John, I'm like, John, can I... Uh, when there's an audiobook version, can I be the, wouldn't it be great if I could be the, the guy who reads the book? And I'm, putting him on, I'm, I'm putting him on the spot right now, but I just think it would be cool synchronicity. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why. Um, two guys from Andover, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I want to call John up right now. Um, I met him over a year ago at a reception in the Stone Chapel. And the thing that was remarkable about him is his um, self-effacingness and his and his humility, and the work that he's been able to do, in certainly bringing Richard Potter and others to life, and, and educating just scores of, uh, of of people in 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 his time as a professor, is just remarkable. So, uh, without further, ado, he's a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you very much. I want to uh, call up uh, John Hodgson, who's, uh... thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Brian. And Dan and Conrad, thank you so much for your demonstration. Uh, I was particularly anxious to have my audience tonight sensitized to the amazing powers of acting by voice. And uh, that's where I'm going to pick up and start today. Richard Potter was a ventriloquist. He was also a magician. He was also a song and dance man. He did uh, a little bit of acting. Uh, the ventriloquism has always been thought of as a part of what he did, one piece of his program. But in fact, the techniques he developed for ventriloquism have been, and I should get this started, this right up there, have been uh, essential to things he accomplished in almost every part, every other part of this act. Uh, let's start with a few of the uh, vent related skills. He didn't categorize these as ventriloquism at all, but uh, he did things like this as part of his program. They were very successful. Uh, the anecdote of the Scotch landlord awakened by an English traveler was a, a popular part of his program often. Uh, he picked this up, uh, the, the, well the great master, the originator of this was James Ranney, who was Potter's mentor in ventriloquism and, and magic particularly. He'd also worked with uh, James's younger brother, John, and I took this illustration of its advertisements from one of John Ranney's, but Richard Potter did this also. The landlord is Scotch, he is very elderly, he is sound asleep, and the uh, wayfarer is an English officer, British, not Scotch, uh, who desperately wants shelter for the night, and he wants in. And you've got the two different accents. You've got the sleepy older voice and the uh, increasingly irate younger voice in whatever kind of British accent that he decided to, to use. It's a little two-man drama being conducted by one man. 
And this was the sort of thing Richard Potter did. He didn't call it ventriloquism, but now think about what you've just seen. You can see that's basically what it was. Let's look at this. Down here at the bottom, part of Potter's uh, ventriloquism this day, and this, he is advertising his ventriloquism. First, an imitation of a child. Uh, you hear his voice in various parts of the room. Uh, but then the forcing the man to unload his load of hay in Portsmouth. This was probably the uh, most venerable of all vent uh, claims. The ventriloquist happens upon a man who is driving a huge cartload of hay, and they heaped them high. Hay was light, and you could pile it up high. And you cause the voice of a child to be heard in the load, which means that a young child has snuck in while the hay was being tossed in, often over the side where people who didn't see it, and is being smothered to death as you listen. And uh, every famous ventriloquist from 1795 through into the 1830s claimed to have done this and often did this on the streets of Paris, in little towns in, London, in, in England, wherever. Uh, Potter himself probably never did it because he didn't go around making enemies like the hay driver. But he used the anecdote and he recreated, basically he did a ventriloquial act imitating a ventriloquial act that he claimed to have done but never did. It's creeping into his program in all sorts of ways. Uh, now, broadly speaking, there were three major developments in American theater during Potter's uh, time. And I'm going to talk particularly about uh, two of those. One was the country's ambition for a distinctively American drama, not a derivative English or English imitative drama. It's something that's American. You've heard of the search for the great American novel. There was a, a desire for America to have its own kind of drama, and particularly a, an American character. What set Americans apart from Englishmen and the people of other countries? What was so distinctively American about them? And uh, the second trend I'm going to talk about is one you've seen hints of here, the development of the one-man drama. Uh, what does an actor do when the theaters aren't hosting uh, troops or companies and uh, the theaters are empty and the actors are unemployed in the off-season and maybe they don't want to be? Uh, if I have time, I will sneak in a few little comments about the third American theater trend at this time, at the very end of the program. I'm going to, I'm going to set that aside for now. Let's talk first about the, the one-man drama. This effectively began, in, began developing in England in the 18th century. And I'm going to feature tonight two aspects of it which fed directly into Potter's programs. Uh, the first one, this was a phrase that Potter used for his program, the name he gave to his program for most of his mature performing life, almost always. An evening's brush to sweep, to sweep away care or a medley to please, or sometimes it would be an evening's brush to sweep away the rust of care. That will give you a hint. We're not talking about a hairbrush. We're talking about a wire brush that would clean a stove that would take rust off of something and make it shiny and new again. The evening brush uh, was a specific kind of entertainment created by a specific set of English actors, one in particular. And it goes back. Uh, this was uh, originally a program uh, that was come up with by an English actor named John Collins, who performed it from the 1770s through the 1790s to great, great acclaim in England. And it was basically a series of theatrical anecdotes, most of them typically of theater going badly, badly wrong anecdotes, interspersed with songs. 
And this format, it, it, it basically gave a, a sort of structure to the evening. There would be, he would open with the song. There would be a theatrical anecdote. He would do another song. And they would be typically popular songs from the theater. He would do another theatrical anecdote and so forth. That was the evening. And a, a little later, a, a famous actor named Charles, and impresario, Charles Dibden, picked this up. Uh, used the same format, it started using recitations instead of anecdotes, but it was, you know, recitations of important theatrical uh, soliloquies, or uh, they could be readings of poems, and then would intersperse them with poems. And this kind of structure, you know, song content, song content, song, was something that Potter latched onto as a kind of structure for his program. And then he also started working on a program called a dissertation on noses. And this also had an 18th century English antecedent and was the title of a specific kind of performance that had been performed for decades and decades and decades, first in England and then it was brought over to America by two or three prominent English actors. The uh, dissertation on noses, well, there was a predecessor. There was a, an Englishman named, uh, oh, who was the first guy? Yeah, George Alexander Stevens created something called a lecture on heads in the 1760s. We're again way back there. This is old fashioned by Potter's time. And he had a series of differently shaped heads, different noses, different facial features. And he would put wigs on them, hats on them, adorn them, address them to personate different characters he was going to discuss. So he gave a little commentary on a series of English types. They might be historical characters. They might just be typical sorts of English people. And a very, very popular. So there was immediate competition, and a man named uh, James Solis Dodd came back with a uh, satirical lecture on hearts, uh, to which is added a critical dissertation on noses. And the dissertation on noses, pardon the metaphor, turned out that really had legs. So in the dissertation on noses, you need, the only prop you need is an artificial nose with a loop that you can slip over your head. And in that character, you then enact a personality who exhibits that kind of behavior, as indicated by the nose. So there would be the red nose of the drunkard. Uh, Potter had names for all of them. There would be the, uh, the, the, uh, the sharp, red-tipped nose of the scold or shrew. Uh, there would be the, uh, uh, the, oh, the shrew was Susan Spitfire, by the way. The toper was uh, Sam Soaker. You get the idea. Uh, Potter would run through uh, six or seven of these, uh, following Dodd's uh, originally, uh, original examples. But then things started changing. Uh, Dodd would uh, give a, uh, a brief talk about this sort of person and then maybe say a few words or maybe a paragraph of the character of that person. Potter started putting the whole thing in character. And then he started adding costumes in addition to the notes to the character. And then he started, all right, we're, you know, dissertation on noses, song. There's something before the dissertation, there would be a song. And then after the song, there'd be some other part of Potter's program. But he started using that same structure, structure in his dissertation or noses. And so Susan Spitfire would enact the role of a scold or a shrew. And then she would do a song and dance in character. And then uh, Sam Soaker, in his turn, or uh, you know, Billy Blunderbuss, you know, the, the boastful, you know, did everything, killed everybody, war hero, probably invented all of it in the bar. Uh, all of these characters, he got it, it was basically, Potter was putting together a sort of sequential musical comedy in a way. 
It was really something very new. It hadn't happened in England. It wasn't happening anywhere else in America at this time. Okay. Uh, Richard Potter is developing this in taverns as well as in huge uh, theaters and auditoriums all around the country. And uh, notice that these things date from the 1760s and 1770s and 1780s, and they were brought over that way by English actors in the 1790s and 1800s. And uh, so that's what America is, is getting excited about in the 1820s. Well, maybe we'll see. But uh, let's rush this on. Uh, in 1822, Potter is really at the height of his career now. Potter is just finishing his huge tour around the country. And by this time, he's uh, back on the, in, in the Northeast. And he's working his way from uh, Maryland up uh, into uh, Massachusetts. In 1822, a very famous English actor, uh, Charles Matthews, who was the most famous comedian in England, comes to America. Charles Matthews had been working on one man shows himself for a long time. And let's look at some of his. For example, he developed a uh, set of entertainments he called At Home. And he would recount adventures that brought together a, a, a strange, eclectic assortment of people, all of whom he enacted. Uh, and, and then most famously, he created one, or more than one actually, which took place in a diligence, a stagecoach that would take you from Calais to Paris, for example. So Englishmen, English families traveling to Paris would be in there, and French families would be in there too, and you have people of all classes coming together, and uh, he does them all. As it happens, Matthews was also one of the first ventriloquists. He actually wasn't technically a very good ventriloquist, but he was a well-known ventriloquist. And his successes in this kind of art form, and you will immediately now recognize how similar this is to what Potter was doing in America. Uh, he brings these skills, but he brings these skills to America with the reputation of being the most famous comedian in England. And all of American theater audiences are desperate to hear and see him. And all of a sudden, in 1822, actors all across America are starting to pay a lot of attention to ventriloquism. And some of them apparently are starting to remember, oh, We've had this ventriloquist all along. For much of that time, Richard Potter was the only ventriloquist in America. By about 1817, he had one other very eminent competitor, uh, a man named uh, Nichols, who uh, did a very different kind of vent act, but uh, they were both very influential. And Charles Matthews basically inspires American actors to explore what the skills of ventriloquism, which they now realize, no, they're not speaking from the belly. They're not throwing their voices magically. They're acting. They're voice acting, and they're very good at it because they paid attention to the nuances. Think what it takes to stay in more than one character for an act like you just heard earlier. Think what it takes. So Charles Matthews sensitizes all of American theater to the significance of ventriloquism as a, a skill set, if nothing else, for acting. And uh, it develops from there. It develops from there. Uh, one, there uh, one of the most famous American comic actors, a, a young man named uh, Roberts, uh, even before Matthews had been in this country, had started co-appearing with Nichols, the other great American ventriloquists at this time. They each did their own thing, but they appeared together several times. He was very attuned to ventriloquism. He later, after this time, uh, actually engaged Richard Potter to come feature as the intermission entertainment of 
theater benefits that theaters in both Philadelphia and Baltimore were holding for him. A benefit was a way that an actor would gain extra income from the engagement. All the proceeds of that one night, all the profits of that one night would go to that actor. So it was very advantageous for that actor to get a lot of people to come that night. They would advertise their benefits in addition to the theaters advertising them. And they would ask people who had enjoyed their work to make a point of coming to that night because that was going to be their reward. And they would also engage important other actors to come feature on the program to pull in more of an audience. And this is one of America's great actors reaching out to Richard Potter for that kind of relationship. Uh, and now I'm going to, I don't know, we'll see if I can cram on number three at the very end, but I, I want to give you this amazing grace note in American history. Uh, right at the time when uh, Matthews is still on his first tour of America, uh, Matthews stayed for uh, a bit over a year on that first tour, I believe it was, and this is, uh, uh, well, he came in late 1822, and now in the fall of 1823. Uh, Matthews is still touring this country. He's going to be in Boston, but I don't think he's made it to Boston yet. Uh, a 14-year-old boy who was a student at Bristol Academy in Taunton, Massachusetts, who was not much of a scholar, to tell the truth, but he already had a reputation as a, a real uh, wag and uh, a practical joker. His name was George Hill. He was a little guy, little George Hill. Uh, he'd been in school, a real school, you know, a, an academy as opposed to a dean school. Been in an academy for just part of a year. And Richard Potter comes to tell. Richard Potter comes to tell. And because it is a theatrical or frivolous entertainment, uh, you will not be surprised, I hope, this is Massachusetts in 1823, to hear that the students of, you know, automatically are banned from attending that show. Uh, this was very typical. They were allowed to go to the menagerie because animals, especially African and foreign, were educational. But you couldn't go to theater. You couldn't go to an itinerant performer's show. But uh, he had heard something about Potter. And he and a friend decided they were going to go anyway. And they would just be discreet about it. So George Hill sneaks off to Potter's show. He is entranced. The magic has him absolutely baffled. He can't begin to figure out what's going on. The songs drive him crazy with delight. He can't stop singing them. He can't get them out of his head. And the dissertation on those is really grabs his attention. I don't usually uh, put on board texts I'm going to read out loud. I hate that kind of redundancy. But you can read it for yourself. Uh, he was really taken with the dissertation on noses. He resolved to get it by heart and get it down right. And it turns out he was very good at stuff like that. And so he did. Uh, he quickly got found out. He could not help singing Potter's songs on campus. And the headmaster soon found him out, or one of the teachers snuffed it out and so forth. And he immediately confessed, which uh, spared him some penalty. He never bothered to find out how much it would have been otherwise. But he was disciplined, theoretically humiliated. It didn't work that way in front of the entire school for his trespass. Let's go on. It made my fortune. It made my fortune. For the rest of my time at school, whenever we had free time, we would go off into barns or fields or behind the fence, and I would reenact Richard Potter's dissertation on notices or other parts of his show for the other people. And this man left the school within about, oh, I don't think he got in more than a full year at the Bristol Academy. Uh, he was maybe 15 when he left. By 16, he was starting to get into acting. By 17, he had roles in Brooklyn. 
By 1822, he was a budding star. He quickly became the iconic Yankee character in America. He was always known as Yankee Hill once he hit his, hit his stride. Uh, he was without any question the most famous actor of his time. He died before the Booths came along. He only lived to be about 40 years old. But, uh, all right, now wait a minute. These were shows that Richard Potter picked up from 1760s and 1770s and 1780s England and learned from an English actor in Boston in 1810. By the time they came out in Taunton in 1823, all these characters were American, recognizably American. They were so American that people were, you know, aghast to realize how close to home they struck. How did they get that way? Because Richard Potter enacted characters that he met and saw and found entertaining and incorporated into his act. And he'd been doing that all along. All right. He really is, in very important ways, the father of this whole tradition of American theater. Uh, a P.S. The third major The third major development in American history at this time is Jim Crow. And when you know that now, you see that coming then. That's pretty amazing juxtaposition because Richard Potter is actually exemplifying everything that Jim Crow was designed to attack. Everything. Thank you very much. Um, when I was a young actor in, uh, in New York, we had a visit. I was in a play off-Broadway uh, at the Negro Ensemble Company, which was started in 1968 by Douglas Turner Ward and a couple of other luminary actors. And um, John, that last story actually reminded me of this a little bit. And um, we were regaled with um, lots of people in the audience. Sometimes they would come backstage and sometimes they wouldn't. It was a play by Leslie Lee called The War Party. But on this one occasion, um, uh, one of those luminaries came in. Uh, it was Robert Earl Jones. Robert Earl J Jones, uh, as many of you know, uh, is was James Earl Jones' dad. And he was in that time probably in his 80s too. Um, his, his son, I think I'd seen him maybe a uh, James Earl Jones and Othello or... Um, maybe a little bit later in um, uh, Fences, uh, August's play uh, around the corner, but just seeing that there's a lineage of black actors who are out like Robeson and Robert Earl Jones and, and now um, the person who began it all, Richard Potter. Um, and he lived here. Just is a, isn't it kind of amazing that, that the, the birthplace, in some ways, of American theater happened. Um, the, the person to settle down, to spend his last, his final days, was Potter. Uh, and in all of those other uh, actors that you see, the great actors uh, of all stripes uh, in America who were trying to do something really different than their English counterparts, it started here. Um, so thank you very much, John, for that. Another applause, round of applause for John Hodgson. Thank you. My name is Lindsay Schust, and I'm a volunteer for the Andover Historical Society. I'm also a Proctor alum, and so it's really exciting to have um, this event here hosted by Proctor, co-sponsored by the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, and the Andover Historical Society, and New Hampshire Humanities. So we're here with, with John Hodgson, the author of this book, 
Richard Potter, America's first black celebrity. First question, John. What was the most surprising thing you discovered in your research about Richard Potter? Well, I don't know if this is exactly the kind of answer you were looking for, but uh, one really uh, wonderful aha moment was when I suddenly put the facts of his life and the larger history of the country together and suddenly realized why after touring around the entire country and going through a long slog of uh, going through very poorly populated areas of southern Alabama and Panhandle, Florida, and uh, across Georgia and up the coast towards New England. He had completely bypassed Savannah and Charleston, which are really the only reasons to go that far. And it turns out that he would have been arriving at the height of the panic about the Denmark Vesey slave uprising that had thrown Charleston into an absolute tizzy of horror and uh, racism and uh, really murderous uh, execution of slaves. Uh, it would have been worth his life to have appeared as a magician and literate black man in Charleston or Savannah at the time. But he was reading the newspapers. He got wind of it by the time he got to Augusta. And a very slow tour across the country suddenly became a very fast trek up through the highlands until he got to North Carolina and Virginia. That was a pretty interesting moment. Just that's why. <laughs> wow, John, that is definitely surprising. In fact, shocking um, revelation to find out there was that kind of violence going on at that time. I mean, it's a nice, uh, it's, it's shocking. So I would follow that with, you said he was mulatto at, or, you know, biracial. Did his audiences know that he was black? And as a mulatto, with uh, one black parent and one white parent. Uh, he would have been considered black at that time, of course. It's very interesting. Uh, in the Boston area where he grew up, everyone knew he was black. He didn't look particularly black. He was in between. Uh, he looked like a dark complexioned white man or a light complexioned black man, depending on what you thought he was. Uh, he often was thought to be the son of an Englishman and a, an East Indian, a Hindu mother. Uh, another way of explaining that, that racial ambiguity. But uh, in the Boston area, he was well known as black. By the time his uh, nephew moved up to help him with the farm in Andover in the 1820s. It was very clear to all of Andover that the family was black. He was listed as uh, white in the 1830s census, but his cousin, I mean, his nephew was listed as black. He was identified in a major New York newspaper as early as 1810 as a colored gentleman. And he had never at that time performed in New York City. This was before he had even been there. Uh, on the other hand, people from far reaches of New England forever believed that he was from, uh, that he was, uh, from the West Indies or that he was uh, of uh, part Indian and English parentage. So there's no simple answer. Uh, I think it's fairly clear that most of the time he was traveling through the Deep South, he was not recognized as black. He was not known as black. You know, if you identified him as black, that might mean that you couldn't properly go attend his performances. And that was not something you wanted to be prohibited from.
So it was just uh, a lot nicer to not say anything about it. And everybody gets to see the show that way. And if I could just follow up with one other thought is um, at that era, during that era, the it, so what you're saying is if you were biracial or if you had any bit of African heritage and you were you considered black? Absolutely. That was true in this country. I mean, I, I grew up in Virginia. It was true in Virginia. One sixteenth, I think, was the Virginia measure until when, the 1970s, something like that? Yeah. Wow, that's that's really deep history. Um, I guess the, I guess the, just if there was any other things you came across or interesting things you wanted to tell the audience about Richard Potter? Well, I'm, I'm talking tonight uh, about Richard Potter's contributions to American theater. And this is something I had not focused on at all when I was researching the book. Uh, he, he was, he acted, he acted pieces of plays, he did one-man shows, but he was never the member of a dramatic company. Uh, he never advertised as a theater performer. It turns out that he was silently but very, very powerfully influencing American theater in all sorts of ways that nobody recognized at the time and, and I had never recognized. So there's still more to learn about the, the impact of this really wonderful man. Great. Well, thank you, John. Here's the book if anyone wants to pick it up. And um, we'll be hearing more about it tonight. So, hi, I'm Dan Richard. I'll be performing uh, at the, uh, for the Proctor Academy uh, for the uh, Andover Historical Society. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for coming all the way up to Andover from New York City, I believe. Yes. Yes. So the first question we have is, what was the most surprising fact you learned about Richard Potter from John Hodgson's book? Well, actually, that uh, uh, Potter was just aside from all his glitz and glamour and his uh, incredible skills, he was just a guy. And he had the same kind of problems that you read about today in, from Hollywood. The people, people in the public eye are no different than anybody else. Okay. Now you've written a book, Ventriloquism for the Total Dummy. And this is part of the book. So how does this work? It's just a simple hand puppet. They call it a dummy. OK, excellent. Um, question is, um, so you mentioned Richard Potter in your book. I was just curious, um, when did you first discover uh, Richard Potter? Well, as a magician, you tend to look over books about magic, and one of them was the history of, of mag magic by uh, Milborn Christopher. He mentions Richard Potter in the book, but he doesn't go into anywhere near the detail that uh, John does in his book. Okay. So Richard Potter's ventriloquism consisted mostly of poly what is it called? polyphony, mm -hmm. yes. Many sounds. Many sounds. Can you demonstrate any polyphony or example of, of bird calls or anything he might have done? Well, it could be, uh, you know, a fox hunt. You would hear the, uh, the hounds chasing after the fox. That is amazing. And um, will you be giving any other shows in the upcoming future? Oh, sure, many, but uh, locally, uh, this is the one. <laughs> Okay. Well, we really appreciate you coming up here. Well, thank you for And your... um, yeah, Dan, Dan Richard, Dan Richard, yes. Richard. Okay. We're here with Brian Thomas, the headmaster of Proctor Academy. Yeah. Who and Proctor has graciously hosted this event, um, celebrating Richard Potter this evening. Um, so we have a few questions for you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the first question is, what is the most surprising thing you learned from John Hodgson's book about Richard Potter? The most surprising thing that I've learned about the book is 
that um, not just that Potter lived in the area, but he was a free man of color. And um, the ripple that he made in American society probably hadn't been seen for at least 10 or 15 years before. So he, being a celebrity meant that people would recognize him even maybe when he didn't want to be recognized. Um, and his fame, I think, allowed him to show people of color in a really different way, particularly black people at that time who 90% or so of, uh, of black folks in America were enslaved in the, in the country. So in many, many ways, that perception, the idea of representation um, is so important. And it's important that, that people from towns from the north to the south, all the way through Canada, um, what was the United States at that time could see him uh, and wink, wink, nudge, nudge, call him something different, <laughs> even though he wasn't. Um, and it's, it still happens today where people transcend race, where I'm not sure if they do, but for some reason people are able to suspend their disbelief on race with people that are exceptional. And Potter was exceptional. Yeah, that was that's great. Um, so I understand you were a professional actor off Broadway and in Hollywood. Are there any elements of Richard Potter's story that you relate to that resonate with you as a performer yourself? You know, it's interesting being a being a professional actor, being a performer. Um, the thing I don't talk about is that you also have to be a close reader and a researcher when you're when you're acting so those elements uh, are in there as well uh, I, I didn't teach acting or drama um, a, a little bit like maybe once every other year but uh, for a week but for the most part uh, the research element the being able to dive down and, and assemble a lot of information and call it down to something very specific is the thing that I relate to the most about Richard Potter's story. And the thing that I love about him is that, you know, that he apprenticed for so many years before he became Richard Potter, the, the famous man. Uh, and that apprenticeship is still, um, it's probably in the background. And uh, bringing that to the foreground, the research, being able to assemble lots of information is, uh, is what I relate to. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Um, so Proctor has a long-standing commitment to multiculturalism, cross-culturalism. Um, so now that we have uh, Richard Potter on the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire in Andover, there is um, an opportunity here for a lot of educational outreach and um, with regard to black history. So I guess my question is, how is the Richard Potter story going to be incorporated into Proctor's history classes or just the, the education here in general? How will it inspire students? I think students will be inspired to know that someone as famous as Potter, so the most famous man I think before that time was, was George Washington. His pictures were sold everywhere. But people knew Potter too. And not just being a famous black celebrity, but just a famous celebrity. Um, and people knowing who he was, knowing his face, understanding his story, and bringing that to the Proctor curriculum. Um, it is like having somebody from their generation, I don't know, Drake, <laughs> uh, Duo Lipa, uh, somebody that they could relate to who also, Trevor, Trevor Noah, that's probably a better uh, example, right? Just somebody who was, was very adept at a lot of different things and having him be a product of Andover is really important, you know, and, and I think our students could relate to that, especially if you put it into some context as to, oh, this person would be like somebody, some contemporary that you would know. Uh, and in many ways it can pull them into the questions, which is, well, why here? Why, why, why Andover? Uh, and when he went out into the world and people were as concerned about him as they were that John talks a little bit about on that last train ride, why was that when other people weren't afforded that? Um, so the things that they, the, the questions 
about Potter being here and the things that it would generate would pull kids in in ways that uh, I don't I don't think that they even would realize how important and special um, and motivational it was um, to be so close to him. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for hosting tonight and for answering these questions. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, we're here uh, this evening with Jerry Ann Bogus, the Executive Director of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. Thank you for coming and supporting and making this event happen. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Yes, we had a couple questions um, regarding Richard Potter we wanted to ask you. Um, first one is, what's the most surprising thing you've learned about Richard Potter through John Hodgson's work? So John Hodgkin's work was really um, pivotal in just about everything we know about Potter um, today. But I think the most pivotal thing that I learned today was from his lecture here at this event, celebrating um, Potter and the marker that we just um, unveiled earlier in the summer. And it was that po um, Potter's work, his um, ventriloquist work that he did, was, we could say, the foreground from which all acting, all actors really imitated and used. And, and it, it would be presumptuous, but he could be called the father of American acting for what the people did. And I thought that was really pivotal in, in the talk, because uh, every he was copied so much from his own creativities, from his own improvising on the work of others, and then others improvise on his work. And that was really good. Yeah. And um, so the Black Heritage Trail New Hampshire tries to bring these stories to light that have been forgotten. And education is a big part of your mission. How do you see the Richard Potter story being a part of the learning experience for adults and children about Black Black history in New Hampshire. So I think it's really important for us to mark these sites of history, to make these places where black history happened in New Hampshire visible to the public. And one of the things that we did, of course, with the, the help of the town here, was to install a marker in August so that it's visible. The marker serves as a historical record of Potter's life right here in the town. And I think what it does for the town, what it does for the students, what it does for the adults is just really raise that awareness. And it's not going anywhere. Markers are permanent. And it, our curiosity gets peaked and we look for more. It's one of the things that we do. We add these markers across to create the statewide trail, but we also create curriculum, and we will put, P, um, you know, these stories. We have a set of stories on our website now um, that Potter is in. So we create these places of how to use the story now when we're when we're working with, especially K, K, um, K through 12 students, on what it means to localize your history, how you connect with that history today, and how that can change your perception of not only what our state is, but the stereotypes of what we think we know about black folks. That's fantastic. And tonight, being at Proctor Academy is a is a good starting point for maybe bringing some of that to the Proctor and to Andover, Andover schools. Absolutely. Any opportunity to educate, we, we, we relish that because I, I personally think education is what changes the world. You know, the more you know, the more you understand, the more we build bridges of understanding, the more we decrease racial anxieties. Yes. And so in addition to all this, um, you're hosting the sixth annual Black New England Conference next month. 16th. Oh, 16th. I'm sorry. Wow. 16th. Okay. Uh, where the money resides, right? An exploration of racialized access and historic exclusion from wealth, if I got that right. Um, will there be any talking about Richard Potter or Black Heritage of Theater at that event? 
So we're not particularly focused on Richard Potter for this, but there we have a presenter who will be talking about the role that theater has played in black communities, um, not only um, social role, but its financial role of supporting communities. And as we can see through Potter's work, when he traveled and when he moved from town to town, it was not in, in, in the house that he built here in Andover. It was a lucrative business for him, right? So we're looking at these alternative forms of labor that um, black folks, people of color, had to um, had to participate in in order to create their own to survive sometimes and create their own wealth, and that definitely is a role that was open to Richard Potter, the role of entertainer. Um, I think we can't miss what it turned into a time when we had Jim Crow law and um, vaudeville shows, but the pureness of where he started and the pureness of the work that continues in black community is, is that rich fodder for not only black culture, but for growth and identity forming. Fantastic. Terri Ann, thank you for speaking with us and thanks for all you do for um, promoting black heritage in New Hampshire and in America. Thank you so much.